Art, Economics, Russia. When observing Dr. Dirk Bull's admirable background, two words come to mind. Money laundering. In between publishing various books and publications on art history and iconic collections and his professorship for art management at the University of Hamburg, he is here to welcome us as president of Christie's in Europe, Middle East, Russia, and India. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to St. James's, a warm welcome to Christie's. We are delighted to partner with the Dubai um, event, which is a non-commercial platform, very exciting for us, being an entirely commercial platform, apart from the fact that we see ourselves as a threat in the cultural fabric and therefore have a great interest in educating, exchanging information, and hosting a platform that has actually been created to bring together everybody who has an interest in interesting watches. So from the maker to the blogger, from the expert to the collector, this is the place to meet, to exchange views and ideas. We are delighted to share you. We are delighted to have been your partner for the past three years and to host you here in your first international platform, if we may say so, because we all know that Dubai is a very international place. Here, you are at the home of Christie's, 252 years now um, in St. James's, not only celebrating Christie's here, but also the great tradition of watchmaking in the UK. So, may your platform be inspired by the place. Welcome. Good morning. Malika Yazjerdi is the kind of person that is only happy when her opponent in an argument gets their facts right, just so she can rewrite them for him. Like a true marketer, she has the gift of storytelling and would rather wear a miniature sundial on her wrist if only she could find one. As the Senior Marketing and Communications Director at Sadiqi Holding and Director of Dubai Watch Week, she wanted more from the watch industry. And here we are at the first International Orology Forum, London 2018. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure to have all of you here with us today for the first international chapter of the Horology Forum. Dubai Watch Week is a testament to when you have shared values, shared vision, and commitment in excellence, dreams come true. We started talking about Dubai Watch Week four and a half years ago, and here we are today in London in the historical landmark and dedication of people that have been coming together over centuries to make beautiful timepieces. Christie's has been supporting us in that shared value and vision, and without great partners, without great journalists, great audience, great speakers and moderators, our dreams would not come true. I'm not going to bore you with the details of uh, the Horology Forum. Dominic has got uh, some interesting uh, conversation pieces to introduce each one of our speakers and panelists today. So without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to her. You're at her mercy for the next two days, so good luck with that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this morning. Thank you. Mohammed Sadiqi, Chief Commercial Officer of Sadiqi Holding, a watchful, no pun intended, encyclopedia by all means, he is a trailblazer in the world of orology in the retail sector. So if you'd like to take a seat. <laughs> Our moderator, a digital savant, riling up the way things are done is Suzanne Wong, editor at large for Revolution International, while avidly banging her gavel on the jury of the GPHG. <laughs> A fervent collector and constant seeker of knowledge in creative and artisanal industries, Hamdan is the student, Hamdan al Hudaidi, is the student and patron our watchmakers keep creating for. <laughs> Al
Aldous Hodge. Let me get back up here. Aldous Hodge, a true example of how there is no allocated time or place for a dream to be pursued, has lunged into the watch industry all hands on deck amidst his career in acting and painting. Founder of Basil Timepiece, perhaps he can lend a fresh viewpoint to his fellow speakers. So, welcome everybody in the room and also our friends online to the very first International Horology Forum, jointly hosted by the excellent folks at Dubai Watch Week and also Christie's. It's a great day out here in central London, but I promise you the action here is going to be hot as fire. So, the topic that we're going to be sinking our teeth in today uh, goes by the extremely sexy title, Battle of the Soothsayers, given that it's the only reliable prediction of the future as well. Time, time, only time, as they say, will tell. So let's kick off the discussion by going a bit into our panelists' experience with locating, placing mechanical timepieces in the digital age. How do you personally and the people around you feel about this traditional mechanical object in the 21st century lifestyles? Which we can start with Mohammed, perhaps, and kind of work our way around. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the Dubai Watch Week uh, panels. Uh, what is time? You know, today, today people look at a, at a watch or a, a device to, to give time, but who actually does look at a watch to, to know time? We have our iPhones, we have the, the watch in the cars, we have time is everywhere. But what really matters today with the, with the, with the mechanical piece is that it, it is a piece of art that we, we carry with us and it's a sentimental value, whether it's passed through from one generation to another, or uh, a watchmaker who spent years and months developing something and realizing and coming up to the end uh, conclusion of a watch. So, so is really a watch a device to say time, or is it a piece of art on our wrist? That is the question, and, and I believe that that is the way we have to perceive a watch, not as, a, as, a, as a, an accessory for us to wear, but more as a piece of art that we have to appreciate and look after it for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Is that how the people around you feel about it as well, when you speak to them, when you explain to them your passion for timepieces, especially you know, amongst your family and your friends? I, I think <laughs> it's changing. I think people are, are looking more and more into watches as as a piece of art rather than and as a device only. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the help and the support we're getting by, 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 by doing the Dubai Watch Week, people, especially in the Middle East region, people are appreciating a watch more than what they used to do 10 or 15 years ago where it was an accessory with, normally it was with diamonds, but now you see people are looking more into having watches with uh, a piece of history in it an old dial, uh, a mechanical breakthrough, something that would give them that extra mile or something to talk about. So, so people are appreciating it in a much better way than what they used to do a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I especially appreciate what you said a bit earlier about comparing it to a piece of art because essentially what it is is <coughs> a piece of someone's uh, creative process on your wrist. It's, part of, it's, it's exactly. really part of someone's life in that way. Um, how do you feel about it, Hamdan? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, everyone for attending mm -hmm. and uh, 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 making us participate in uh, this forum. Uh, my uh, point of view and opinion, um, now of course the, the smart watches or smart intelligence watches will evolve our mm -hmm. lifestyle some way, but it cannot be compared to a mechanical watch. Mm -hmm. A mechanical watch today is a is done by a watchmaker who's an artist, as I mentioned, a, a, a physicist, a painter, a sculptor, and an engineer mm -hmm. who crafts this piece with passion and love. Exactly. You a know, fine example being the piece on your own wrist. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, for this outcome, mm -hmm. you know, and it would last for a decade, two, three, or, or a century. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this smart gadget. Uh, there, there will not be an emotional bond. Eventually, you will have to replace 
uh, as technology goes on. Well, as a mechanical watch will always stay, will always stay for a century to a decade. As we, we, we've seen, we see, and we will see. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. All this, uh, how about your take on this? Uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Bonjour, ça va? Um, to piggyback on what uh, Mohammed and Amdan said, I, I completely agree in that. With watchmaking, you're buying something that can help substantiate the idea of legacy, right? Um, I can appreciate from the idea of the digital age. It took me a long time to find some sort of appreciation for the digital watches, but the fact that people are still buying them says to me they're still interested in the idea of a watch. Now, some people say, well, you know, why do I need a watch to tell time? I can do that on my phone. If that's the case, why buy a digital watch? The idea of it mm -hmm. is substantiated. It's, it's, um, it's, it's uh, more of an experience, right? Mm -hmm. If you want an elevated experience, you're going to go to the foundation, which is a mechanical mm -hmm. watch. Mm -hmm. Because, as I was uh, explaining yesterday, for me, it's not about telling time so much as it's about how you tell time. I do want something that is going to last me 50, 100, 200 years to help tell the story of my legacy uh, versus something that will have to be replaced in one or two years. I want something that is going to represent my idea of class, culture, and eloquence. And when I buy a watch for a very particular reason, it is for just that, to represent these things about me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a very big difference in the representation of wearing, you know, say, a, a, you know, a, a, a Grubel Forse, when I see that, I'm like, hmm, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's about, if, if you know them, I know that you have a very keen eye mm -hmm. in terms of class and taste, right? Yeah. You have a very selective um, idea of choice. Mm -hmm. And then it says something so very specific and unique about you that it makes me interested in you in a very different way. I want to know your story, your experience. What got you to the point where, you know, this particular piece came across your desk because we are making functional mechanical pieces of art. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, Shout out to our friends in the room, by the way. Well, <laughs> you know, it's like, look, you can buy a Monet, you can buy a Picasso, and that's great. But you can also have one on your wrist that you can take around with you everywhere you go. Exactly. It's a bit difficult to, to wear a painting on your wrist, shall we say. It's not exactly the most convenient thing to cart around. I really appreciate what you said about it being um, kind of an expression of self-identity. I want to dig into that a bit more because we had a conversation yesterday, Hamdan, yes. when we were sort of in the front row during John's uh, presentation um, about the objects that, you know, take the, they, they occupy the real estate of mechanical watches and how digital watches, in terms of when people talk about the threat that they pose to, to mechanical watches, they don't replace them at, at all as objects, but they do take the same space that they do. And once they do, like, you know, there's only, there's only certain, you have two wrists, let's put it this way. And once you've got something on there, uh, you know, there isn't space for something else. So I want to ask you guys about like sort of the modern generation of uh, digital natives that you know you come across in your life as like you know young people in the prime of life, mm -hmm. and um, what modern objects do you think uh, replace or attempt to replace the wristwatch in our lives, and to what extent do you think they succeed? Maybe mm -hmm. Hamdan, we can start with you. Um, a, a smart a smart watch, maybe the, the the younger generation would want to experience. A smart watch, mm -hmm. but they will always look at the surrounding. They look at their elder brothers, uh, their fathers, and they would eventually want to, to be different in a way. Mm -hmm. This won't make them different, you know. Um, uh, having uh, a smart watch uh, on the wrist, they would not experience the weight for a piece uh, or for an art piece. Like I said, uh, uh, different uh, different watch maker, makers with different personalities. Uh, limitless abilities uh, would uh, give, out, give out different results and uh, uh, different uh, beautiful pieces that they will eventually want to, to own and have, uh, have those pieces. Um, it would not replace, they will want to have a wristwatch on, on their, on their uh, hand one day, mm -hmm. 
and uh, they will uh, they will have to experience the wait for a peace eventually mm -hmm. if they could not find it. Yes, that's true. Um, all this, you hang out with a lot of young, cool people in, your, <laughs> in the course of your day job. Those young whippersnappers. <laughs> <laughs> well, yourself being one of them, of course. Um, when you do speak to them, like people in your circle, people that you encounter uh, in yeah. your daily life, like, uh, how do they react when you sort to like, you know, communicate about your passion of mechanical watches? Well, I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about my passion. Most people think that I'm a, uh, simply a collector and then I'm like, no, I, you know, I design watches. Okay, cool. And then I'm actively you know, trying to develop watches. They're like, oh, this is a, not it's so a much of a thing. hobby. I'm yeah. like, no, it's not a hobby. I, I stay up to six o'clock in the morning drawing watches. Like, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. What I realize when I speak to people is a lot of times maybe the novice a uh, self-proclaimed collector or someone who doesn't understand the value or proclivity of, of, of a watch, they don't understand how to appreciate a watch. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as educating them. I've talked to so many people where, you know, I explain the process, the time it takes, the difference between a, a, a massively produced watch versus a handmade watch and, the, you know, the care that goes into it. And then I will get a call about a month later saying, you realize you're responsible for me now spending all of my free money on watches. I'm on all these websites. My wife is mad at me. Yes. I'm like, you're welcome. I'm not mad at them. I will, I will take full responsibility because it is about educating people, but in a way that's palatable, you know, because at the, at the root of what we do, it is art where, where art is bridged with science uh, cohesively. Uh, and the scientific part is a little tough for people to get around, the physics, the metallurgy, the, the, the micromechanical engineering, and a lot of people don't understand that aspect. And then there's also the art where, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's not an art that applies to me, but when you understand what goes into the art, what initiates the art, that passion is transferable to anything that you do, because a watchmaker Hello, welcome to the Insane Club, because it is full-on passion. You are dedicating so much time and effort to this one thing, and your DNA is fully into it. Mm -hmm. Very synonymous, again, with painting, or if you want to make a fine car. Uh, but when people get to appreciate the passion, then that transpires, and, 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 and it transcends, rather, the idea of well, why do I need it? Why this? Why that? Oh, I understand why. Because I can respect it. Yeah. And there's a younger generation that doesn't understand necessarily why, but then when they realize it's more about inclusive representation of a very specific thing about you, mm -hmm. they begin to start seeking what that specific thing is, and then they go find their watch, mm -hmm. you know? It's interesting what you say about, you know, that kind of passionate, invested relationship that you have with a mechanical watch that perhaps you might not share with a, you know, a smart watch or a personal device like that. Uh, Mohammed is, you know, kind of the leader, well, one of the leading voices in international retail for watches. Uh, you know, you speak to young people and I know that you are passionate and committed to spreading the word amongst the younger generation of the charm and the, the attraction of a mechanical timepiece. We speak to the younger generation about their, their personal devices and, you know, their, their, their smart objects or whatever. Do you get the sense that it's easy to transmit that kind of passion and affection and committed relationship that you would have with a watch, for example? Well, commenting back to what Hamdan said about uh, digital watches and the younger generation is... Uh, and I, I always remember this it was at the first Dubai Watch Week we had a couple of years ago in Dubai when, uh, when Mr. Beaver said that he's not threatened by the digital watch coming into the market, whereas they're helping the watch industry by making people getting used to wearing the watch. And, and I, I believe that was a very well said uh, statement from Mr. Beaver, who's considered as a marketing guru in the watch industry today. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the young generation and how they are connected the whole time on social media, whether it's Instagram or, or uh, Snapchat or whatever. I'm not in, on any of them, so I'm away from all of this. 
and, 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 and seeing the younger generation now that they are looking and asking about digital watches. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily something expensive, but they start, for example, I'm talking about young, really young uh, kids that are asking about the Alec Monopoly watch, for example, mm -hmm. or asking about the <coughs> digital uh, smartwatch from Hublot, which is uh, a gateway to starting loving something specific. Um, a lot of the younger generation were talking about a watch which we might all think it, it was something crazy, which was from Moser, the Swiss Alp watch, which was uh, the only mechanical watch with one function, which is giving time. So we see that people or the younger generation are tending and looking and reading and asking more about the watch industry than ever before. I, I see that with my kids, with my nephews, with, uh, with, uh, with the young generations around us. I'm talking about a very young generation. Mm -hmm. So it is something that is growing. Uh, auction houses are helping because in auctions and the prices are, are flying, especially for vintage watches. Uh, talking about the, 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 the auction where they sold the Paul Newman's Paul Newman mm -hmm. with, a, with a crazy price of $17 million mm -hmm. yes. for a watch that is made out of steel 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Who would think about it? And at that time, maybe it was, what, $2,000? Yes. But so, do you necessarily feel that the purchaser of that watch is really a fan of mechanical watch making or really sort of the value of the watch as a sentimental object linked well, to the person. You see, you see what I mean? Uh, I remember once uh, a big collector told me that a watch is like a painting in terms of being uh, a piece of art. So the case of the watch is always considered as the frame mm -hmm. and the dial and the movement is considered as the piece of art. And if you take the square centimeter of a watch compared to a Picasso or a Monet or something, mm -hmm. the average is more expensive mm -hmm. of a watch. Well. So, so it is a piece of art and we have to look what is the content of the watch rather than what is outside. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the sentimental value or having really mechanical value, I think really it depends from one watch to another. Mm -hmm. uh, the Paul Newman watch obviously is, has a historic reason behind it. Uh, it's an iconic piece. Uh, any collector would want to have a Paul Newman watch in his or her collection. Uh, a very basic mechanical watch, a chronograph, without a date. But historically, it is considered as the most iconic watch in our modern world. Mm -hmm. um, while we're on the subject, I want to sort of focus a bit more what you just said a bit earlier about bringing value to the life of like the person who's actually wearing it. What unique value can we actually communicate to people who are you know, looking to buy a mechanical timepiece? And the key word here is unique. What does a mechanical watch do for a person's life that makes it objectively better in a way that another object wouldn't? Satisfaction. It feels good <laughs> to have a mechanical watch. It feels good. Yeah. Right? So honestly, it, it, it does feel good. I, I was just telling uh, some of the friends here that I sleep with my watch. And I like to put my watch under my ear and just listen to tick tock, tick tock, yeah. tick tock. I think all of us here in this room can appreciate the level of intimacy that Muhammad <laughs> is sharing with us right now. What do you guys think? Um, do you have that? You know, for me, a watch was always. Um, indicative of representation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started, and, and some of you, you know, know the story, but when I started uh, very young, uh, times were a little rough, you know. My family, we've been through a few things, you know. Uh, been homeless a few times, you know. Um, but the mindset was, I want to achieve. I want to be successful in whatever moniker, you know, that, that actually represents the idea of success. But with my mother, she often expressed to me that, you know, they can take everything in this world away from you except for what you know. So education was a tentpole in my house, right? So I was like, if I, if I want it, I can make it. But then I also heard when I was young, the sign of a good businessman, good shoes, good suit, and a good watch. 
So to me, the shoes and the suit were easy. Getting the right watch took a little time. But it represented my story. It represented the idea of achievement, not necessarily financial, but cultural, systemic achievement. The idea that people looked at me and thought that I was supposed to be less than or be subpar, and I can disprove the theory. I think for so many other young people, the idea of getting a very specific watch, you know, when I get this promotion, I'm going to get this, da, 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 it's because it is tied to achievement, and that is a part of the legacy we pass down. And I think with what we can do is we can help to share that idea of what the representation of this, this work of art is, because so many of what, the things that we acquire, so many of the material things we acquire are material and or aesthetic representations of what we're trying to say. We wear clothes specifically to say something you know, about ourselves. It's, it's a language. Everything we have, everything we wear, everything we do without speaking actual words, it's a language that we're trying to transfer. So when you look at a watch, it's not so much about the financial value behind it, at least not for me. It's about the story. And I can tell you that story. When you ask me about my watch, I can tell you what exactly it took me to get to that point. I can tell you right now I'm wearing a Gerald Genta because he was one of the first people to inspire my idea of design. And I wear this out of respect and homage to him. You know, uh, and that is a part of what got me on this seat today. So it means so much more to me than just having a fancy watch on my wrist. This is emotional. If I lost this, I would lose my mind. I'm going under every seat like, where did it go? But I think it's that much and more for so many collectors. And we also can transfer or, or inspire, incentivize a younger generation at a younger age to understand those values as well, because they're looking for it. You know. But the digital age is quick. Mm -hmm. it's, it's immediate gratification. How can I get this now? Boom, bang, boom. This takes time. And regardless of how quickly we can access information, building that information, building that model of success takes time. It is the same value. And this will always represent that valuation to me. And I think we can also allow the younger generation, whether they're in the digital age, whether they're making their living off the digital age, they can use this as a representation of what it took to achieve that success. I love the idea that you brought up, that you just spoke about, actually, because we talk about quick fix, digital culture, how everything's very rapid cycle in that. Do you actually feel that, yes, this kind of inoculates minds against the values of watchmaking, which is traditional, or do you think that it creates a desire for that kind of value reversal because they're so saturated in it, they kind of want something different? Hamdan, you, you know, you've got a young family. Like, how do you plan to transmit this kind of... This, this kind of desire to someone who's like someone like, uh, like your son. Learn how to, to appreciate, first of all, the work of the watchmaker, mm -hmm. the effort uh, the watchmaker or the artist uh, did put in, in this piece, which is, uh, which we just, uh, Mr. Muhammad mentioned, it's no less than having a, for instance, since Picasso is known by everyone, no less than having a Picasso on your wrist. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they will have to learn how to appreciate and um, by, by, by learning who this artist is mm -hmm. and how long uh, did uh, this outcome take for this beautiful result. Mm -hmm. They will have to learn how to appreciate and once they know how to appreciate, they would want and wish to have this, mm -hmm. this piece. Um, the example you shared with us a bit earlier, all this about you know, telling your friends about and kind of like infecting them almost with this kind of passion and them kind of like... Oh yeah like, you know, cussing you out for it. Um, how has your experience sharing, have you had a similar experience sharing this with friends, like sort of inducting them, bringing them into this world, like, which you're so passionate about? Of the mechanical watches? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Of, uh, and do you get the same reaction? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, they would love to. Um, like, who does not, like, my generation love, loves the, the, the mechanical watches, but mm -hmm. everyone would want to experience uh, uh, the, the, the smart watches or the digital watches. Mm -hmm. But this generation, even though they experience, they would go back to the mechanical watches. Mm -hmm. The younger generation would experience, but they will eventually want to, imp to, to upgrade. Mm -hmm. They would want to upgrade mm -hmm. to, to, to a mechanical watch. 
And what about you, Mohammed? Do you have a particular example of someone that Muhammad, you really... Mohammed said uh, regarding Hublot, the digital watch. Yeah. Mohammed, it will eventually stop updating, right? Yes. They Absolutely. will have to go to, 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 uh, to a new one because it stopped updating. They will either go to a new one, to a new, new one, or they will jump to the mechanical watch. Or they will force people to exchange it for a new mechanical watch. Yes. yes. Well, it's I think that's the idea. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite example you want to share with us or someone that you've been very happy to sort of induct and sort of bring into this community of the love of mechanical watches? Well, uh, there are many, you know, being, being in the retail industry, mm -hmm. selling watches, uh, we saw a lot of changes where people change from no watch to a digital watch to being collectors, mm -hmm. I would say. And uh, I would say the trend is, uh, is, is, is not only because of what we are giving them as, as retailers or as, uh, as what we are doing by Dubai Watch Week or by what the watch brands are doing. It's, it's, it's a help with the bloggers, it's the help with the media, it's a help of a little bit of everyone for people to realize what is a watch, mm -hmm. why to have a watch, what are the values of a watch. So it's, it's a joint uh, effort. Without the watchmakers, we don't have the nice watches. Without the, the media and the bloggers and all the social media, we won't have the coverage. Without uh, us as retailers, we won't have the windows to show the, the clients the watches. And without us as watch lovers, mm -hmm. there's no use of watches. So it's a support of everyone to, to, for us to reach where we are today. and. Uh, and we've seen a lot of people that, uh, that changed hands from a digital watch, whether it's because of the battery, whether it's because they're always connected and they just want to be disconnected, whether it's uh, appreciating more a mechanical uh, timepiece because of its looks, because of its details, but it starts somewhere, always. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that it's growing more and more. Uh, we are suffering today with a small global crisis, which no one is mentioning about, but uh, we, we see it. But uh, I can see in the watch industry, or well, at least in Dubai, we see that people are still interested regardless of the crisis. Okay, they're not spending as much as they used to, but people are investing in watches mm -hmm. more and more. So it is there and people are liking it more and uh, they're going for it. Uh, we had some situations where we saw clients wearing two watches, mm -hmm. a mechanical watch and a digital watch. I have an example of my uncle who wears only two mechanical watches, no digital watches, because he likes it and he appreciates it. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are connected would still have the digital watch to mm -hmm. have their steps, their heartbeat, uh, whatever details they want about their health. But uh, if you think about it, 10 years ago, we still had a heartbeat, we still were healthy, and we were still doing whatever we were doing without having it monitored or followed by a wristwatch. So why not do it still? I love that you've taken the discussion into slightly controversial territories, the fact that you mentioned that no one's talking about the crisis <laughs> of the, the market situation. I think that's cool. I want to keep on that because up till now we've been talking about how to maintain the relevance of this industry to audiences. And what Aldis and I were talking about a bit earlier is actually opening up the discussion to new audiences and new markets and like areas of the demographic, the watch buying demographic that we haven't really discussed before. Because uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but this being the opening panel of the International Horology Forum, I think, I believe five years ago, a panel like this would be exclusively white and male. And as you can see, that's not necessarily the case right now. And uh, <laughs> or maybe I need to get my eyes checked, but you know, not from where I'm sitting anyway. <laughs> so uh, yes, let's talk about new audiences and how to really make this relevant to them in, in, in an industry that so far has been dominated by particular voices. Anyone want to start? Um, <laughs> Don't all rush. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before I jump on that, I, I definitely want to piggyback on what you were saying about the crisis. I, I, I'm only 32, so, you know, when the courts crisis came around, I, I'm not even sure I was here. But uh, I feel like 
mechanical watchmaking is in a similar situation where the thought or fear was that the quartz era would destroy us. It forced us to look at what we did differently. It forced us to market differently and create a few things differently, take a few different paths and innovate. And at the crux of what our main responsibility as uh, watchmakers, you know, as, you know, innovators, are, we, we have to innovate. We're yet again challenged with that very same premise. We just have to innovate. And I look at this digital age the same way I look at the course age. I believe that we are definitely going to power through. You're going to see some new avenues being taken, but we're just going to innovate. And we will restructure the way people understand and see watchmaking. And we can all flourish. The digital will stick around for a while, but I think, as Hamdan said, it will get to a point where people's interests will grow to evolve and say, OK, this is cool, but where is the basic foundation of it? Because humans are naturally curious, and we always want to get back to center. And how do we get back to this thing that created or started x, y, and z, right? So I feel no fear. I feel excitement about the challenge to innovate, and now we have to do a little extra homework. That's fun. But that's our jobs initially. And then that goes further into the idea of marketing and speaking to new audiences, maybe some audiences that haven't been acknowledged uh, uh, particularly. Uh, in, in my experience, when I first started uh, getting into watchmaking, I felt like the female audience wasn't acknowledged well because Reach. Oftentimes, um, there was the idea in terms of marketing that women were not as competent to understand mechanical watchmaking, right? I never saw the marketing skewed towards women. When for me, a lot of my contacts in the business who actually helped bring me in were women. I'm like, Where's the complication? Where's the ladies' complication that's, you know, this, that, and the other? And then over the years, I saw that it was increasing a little bit more, the, the, the voice, the outreach, the acknowledgment of women. And I appreciate that, because there's an entire deficit there of, of attention being paid. There's a monopoly of opportunity in every avenue. And I think it always comes down to how do we target the audience that we don't see yet, because everybody pays attention. You know, look, I'm a little, little boy from who was raised in New Jersey, all right? I was in Trenton, in, in the back, you know, the worst of the worst, you know, and then went to, to Hackensack, which was, you know, great. But still, you know, nobody was targeting me, but my interest was there. And it eventually turned from a passion to a job to now obligation to help build out that passion and share it. But my interest was always there. There are so many people who have that interest, whether they have the means or not. And we have to figure out, how do we reach that buyer? How do we reach that member who could be our potential next great, you know, the next George Daniels or the next Breguet or, you know, the next Roger Smith? Like, how do we reach that person who is interested but doesn't realize that we acknowledge them or that we see them. And that comes down to the marketing. Mm -hmm. I think that's super relevant because now that we've thrown the doors open on this topic, representation, I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to put you on the spot right now Oof. and say, uh, what do you think that we could really change about the stories that we're telling about watchmaking? Who's doing a good job of it? I'm not going to say who's doing a bad job of it because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to break anyone's, uh, you know, give anyone a hard time about this. So yeah. Why don't we start off with Mohammed? Who do you uh, think is doing a good job of speaking to new audiences in that representative way that Aldous just brought up? Richard Mill. Mm -hmm. In uh, what way? He's, he's out. He's, uh, everyone knows Richard Mill today. Uh, he, he, he introduced a product that is recognizable. He, he targeted uh, people in the sport industry not necessarily the number ones, but people who are very much related to the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's been everywhere. Mm -hmm. he, he started the brand. And I remember meeting, uh, meeting Richard Mill with my father and my uncle in 
1999 or 2000 in, in Basel, and, uh, and both my father and uncle told him, you're crazy to do a watch at this price. And at that time, it was the RM1 at, it was maybe at around today's price, 120,000 Swiss francs. And today you get a basic watch more expensive than that. Uh, he just targeted specific audience. Uh, and today, even the younger generation, you would see people wearing fake Richard Mills because of the iconic design and mm -hmm. because of how Richard developed the brand and made, made it reach where it is today. He produces 4,000 watches a year. It's nothing for mm -hmm. the whole world. But everyone is talking about it. People start conversations with Richard Meal. People love the design. It's, uh, he's using different materials in terms of uh, cases, in, in, in terms of uh, the, 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 the mechanism. It's made of different cases. Mm -hmm. He is marketing it right. Mm -hmm. He is talking about it. He is sharing it with the people. People know him. So even though he's not a watchmaker, <coughs> He's a purely design person, but he created a brand with passion, with love, and by passing to the world of it being exclusive. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that in a way he really sort of brought a new kind of watch buyer into the market as yes. something you can observe? Yes. Uh, we see that the trend of people who are buying Richard Mille watches are not the people who are buying a Patek Philippe or any classic watch. It's a totally different uh, uh, way of looking at it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's not to say that the guy who's buying a Patek isn't going to buy a Richard Mille. No, well. not necessarily. No, no. I, I'm not saying that, but it's a totally different way of thinking, I would say. Uh, a person who buys a first watch as a Richard Mille, try to convince him to buy a Patek, very difficult. Mm. But the person who has a Patek Philip to buy a Richard Meal for the sake of having one Richard Meal in his collection, easy. Just to complete the, the set. Yes, but, but a person who, who got used to wearing a Richard Meal, being light, being sporty, being colorful, mm -hmm. tell him to wear a Patek Philip Calatrava. It's my grandfather's watch. <laughs> but he wouldn't look into the details in the watch because mm -hmm. he's more following a certain trend. Mm -hmm. But again, coming to the point that you mentioned that the way Richard Meal benchmark his product was in a very smart way. Mm -hmm. And people started talking. And after Richard Meal, after the millennium, we saw a lot of small brands coming up. I wouldn't say in the same way as Richard Meal, but with an evolution in the watch industry with new ways of telling time, with the new, new uh, materials used, with uh, always something different. But mm -hmm. that was where he started. And it took him, it took him a good five to seven years to, 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 to take off. Mm -hmm. But he, he believed in his brand, and he worked on it hard. And uh, people know him by name. <coughs> and again, I, I, I will come back and say that he's not a watchmaker. Yes. So imagine we have a watchmaker that is able to do that mm -hmm. as an artist or a creator. Mm -hmm. What would happen? I think... Uh, yeah, if you could sort of apply this to, to more approaches. As a collector yourself, uh, Hamdan, I mean, you're wearing something that is at the same time extremely classic and traditional in terms of its uh, construction and uh, the skill set, but it's also very avant-garde in the way it presents itself aesthetically. So how do you see yourself as a collector in those categories that Mohammed just talked about? Uh, contemporary and, and traditional. For instance, Grubel Forsey is, is contemporary art, mm -hmm. and Roger Smith is traditional. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, um, this type of, this, this kind of work is, uh, is contemporary. You know, with with the traditional touch, mm -hmm. but uh, when when you see Roger Smith's work, it's 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 beautiful tradition with with, with a very high bar. Mm -hmm. You know that that I did not see uh, yet uh, any watchmaker uh, from the tr traditional aspect mm -hmm. in this uh, this uh, this level. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I see myself as uh, traditional. 
traditional contemporary. Mm -hmm. Purely as someone who, you know, actually goes out there and buys watches, spends money on them, uh, you know, kind of following on the same question I asked Mohammed, who do you think is doing a good job of speaking to you at the moment? Not necessarily in terms of the products they have, but in terms of their communication, what they represent and what do you think they add to you? Who I do you have, think is doing a really uh, good job? I have that? met uh, many watchmakers, mm -hmm. artists, and uh, all of them are, are amazing. Uh, but uh, I've been contacting recently, maybe because of my interest, maybe because of my interest uh, in, their, uh, in their product or their pieces. Uh, it was always easy to, to speak to Group al mm -hmm. and uh, uh, always easy to get the information to, to convince me in my missing gaps. And the same with Roger Smith as well. Uh, it, it has always been easy. Uh, with them. Maybe because uh, lately, like, I'm in this direction, mm -hmm. uh, but I have tried uh, the past uh, five, six years. The easiest communication until now, it was with, uh, with uh, Grubel Forsey and, and Roger Smith in, in, the, in, the, in the sense of knowledge, mm -hmm. exchanging knowledge and knowing, uh, knowing answering my question, the, 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 quest, the question uh, I wanted an answer for. Mm -hmm. A bit earlier, we brought up the example of the Moser, actually, Edouard, how's it going? Um, and we talked about the importance of telling these stories in a new and fresh kind of way. Aldous, as an actor, you really sort of understand the importance of storytelling and engaging with your audience in, in that specific way. So who, like, not as a, as a buyer, someone that you would necessarily, like speaking from your perspective of a watch that you actually buy and put on your wrist, but who do you think tells the best stories right now in terms of watch communication, how they market themselves, who grabs people? You gonna put me on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> I, did. Did it, I yes. do not want to be I in this back. seat right now. It's getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see, who's telling the best stories? Hmm. It's tough because I think that uh, a lot of great brands are telling um, really fine stories uh, mechanically, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I think would be fantastic would be to see the actual human side a little bit more. Mm -hmm. What these watchmakers go through to get to that product. Um, the family life, the sacrifice, the, not making a reality show of it, but <laughs> you know, showing, you know, I spent three, four years or whatever uh, sleeping on a couch, using every penny I had just to make this one, you know, piece, this bridge, this balance wheel, this, this main plate or whatever, just, just to, to fund the dream. I think um, giving an audience a more in-depth look at what that is uh, would help them to understand what this is mm -hmm. that we do. Again, like I said, there are a lot of grand companies that are telling the stories yeah. mechanically and commercially quite well. Do you have an example um, for us? You say what? Do you have an example for us? An example. I do have to say, <laughs> um, I would agree that, uh, you know, Rashad Mill, I, I would definitely agree with you uh, there, Mohammed. Rashad Mill does he, 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 he has created a new idea of, I guess, the cool factor. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, it, I hope you're watching this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, there are brands to speak that, that speak to me definitively because of innovation, mm -hmm. right? And I meet a lot of people who may not be watch collectors but understand the innovative aspect of design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do think that w what started my, my, my career path in terms of looking at design and trying to figure out how to design well, uh, I can thank Grupal Forsey for, for that inspiration because of the way they took something, you know, the, the, the tourbillon, the way they took that and reformatted it in a very contemporary way. And when you look at it, you know for certain you're looking at a piece of art. So whatever 
they do or have done. When you look at the piece, you know it's transcribing the idea of art, you know. Um, I think Kari does a, a Kari Lenin does a really fantastic job of composition, a uh, really fine work. Um, I think Hamdan, you're you're definitely right in that. Uh, Roger, you know, Roger Smith has elevated the bar of what I call it, it's very classic. It's not boring. No. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. You not know, boring, yeah. you look at it and you're like, well, you know, I mean, who wants, why would you buy a watch? Why you, but you look at that and you're like, oh, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, that, that's why? Okay, it makes sense. Because there's, there's a, um, the attention to detail is insane. But you're also teaching. It's not just this is the bar and this is where I'm going to do and you know I mean this is where I'm going to go and this is how far I will. It, there's this is what you know. Mm -hmm. This is the next level. This is what I'm teaching you. And there are several brands that teach, which each piece that they they put out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm a particular fan of the Moser dials. You know, H. Moser dials. Uh, it teaches me something about color. I'm a painter as well. I'm always looking, I'm very, very particular about certain hues and, and different tones, which is why, you know, uh, John's speech yesterday was particularly interesting to me <laughs> about colors. But it teaches me how to use color in different ways, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, you know, technologically, artistically, uh, I think they're, they're doing exceptional in those those areas uh, selfishly mm -hmm. as a consumer I just want to know more about the watchmaker and how they connect to, to, to me um, there is the watchmaker's apprentice which I definitely have you know the story between George Daniels and Roger Smith because George Daniels was like <laughs> you know he's, he's, he's the man and then you're like oh wow and you see a whole different side of the idea and you're like this is cool because now I know you and I have a more personal relationship. So um, I think we have a huge advantage as watchmakers and watch brands to give the audience synonymously along with our product, our essence, our soul, who we are as people. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot personally as a writer, as someone who talks about watches to, to people who read my magazine, presumably, um, is the difference between talking to a watch collector, someone like yourself who has a lot of um, knowledge and understands watches very well, and speaking to a watch buyer, because they're not necessarily the same thing. A watch collector right. is also a watch buyer, but the reverse doesn't always apply. Right. And do you find that because we've been talking about brands such as... Uh, uh, Richard Mill, which has you know very strong communication, but it's also a very sort of niche sort of market for people who really understand what they're going for. And then you have brands like uh, what we mentioned earlier, Hublot, who uh, communicates in a very in a more sort of a robust way to a wide audience. And someone like uh, Global Force or Butilainen, which is really even more niche. We're going to really sort of points of communication right here. Why do you think that the message sort of splits that way? It diverges between when we're talking to a watch collector versus when we're talking to a watch buyer. Shouldn't they really appreciate the same things? And do you find that, Hamdan, as a watch collector, the message needs to be really quite radically different? A watch buyer. A watch buyer today could... The, 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 the first watches he would buy if he did not have a collection are known. Mm -hmm. Brands are known. He would not. He would not go because, um, at, at the beginning and the end, when he wants to buy a watch, it's definitely to represent him. So he would go for the known watches or the, the watches that people know the most. He would not go for Volantanin uh, uh, Kari, mm -hmm. or he would not go for Dufour or uh, mm -hmm. Richard, uh, Richard Smith, uh, uh, um, Roger Smith. So, because. Um, this is ind independent watchmaking that he will, he will have to understand uh, other than being a, a buyer. Uh, so only people who understand or will have the knowledge would go into, into independent watchmaking. Mm -hmm. But a buyer would definitely go for the known brands, which are the, the common brands uh, in the market, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. What's your take on this, Mohammed? Like speak because you know you speak to watch buyers as well as collectors all the time. Well, people start as watch buyers, 
and end up if 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 they if they like what they are getting into, mm -hmm. they become hopefully collectors. Do you have a magic formula for making this conversion? Trade secrets alert. Uh, secrets yes, we, 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 we give them some drinks in the shop with <laughs> some <laughs> <laughs> magic portion to to become collectors. <laughs> no, okay. Wait a um, I think it's it's a matter of self educating, reading about uh, about the different brands and how they started and how how they reached to where we're what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, funny talking about this, I I, I met <coughs> one of our uh, dear friends and 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 the collector today, who who came to me many years ago mm -hmm. and wanted to buy one of the Opus series from Harry Winston. If I'm not mistaken, it was the Opus three, which was delayed and delayed and delayed. And uh, it was his first watch to buy. <laughs> so he started the opposite way around, yes. you know. And I was really impressed by this gentleman because when I told him, why don't you go for a Patek Philip? He said, it's a commercial piece. So I told him, read about it. Know the history. I didn't, I didn't tell him that what you're taking now in, in terms of Debitune or, or Moser or, or, or the Opus series or MBNF are wrong. They are, they're more than right. Mm -hmm. But you have to know the history of watches. Where did they come from? How did they start? Traditional watchmakers and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and today he's still one of the biggest uh, watch collectors, mm -hmm. I can say, in, in, in Dubai. And I'm sure Hamdan knows him. He's a, he's a common friend. <laughs> But, uh, but the way he started, and I, I, I remember also another watch that I showed him, which was a Richard Mille, uh, the Nadal, the first one. And he saw it, and he said, wow, it's a beautiful watch. How much is it for? And I told him the price. He said, I'm going to sell my house to buy this watch. So it was that extreme for a watch buyer to, to, to jump into these kind of conclusions. But, mm -hmm. but I with hope time, he found a less extreme way to acquire the watch, by the way. Yes, he did. <laughs> So, so he started reading more about watches. He, 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 he met a lot of the watchmakers. Uh, uh, and he's helped a lot of people to understand what is a watch mm -hmm. because of his passion for watches. It's not because I told him, listen, do this. I'm going to pay you or something. Or He loves it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started all, I would say, thanks to Max, Max Busser for the introduction of the Opus series where he, he, he made or he, he gave the opportunity for a lot of people in the watch industry to, to come out and be known <coughs> to the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started with the Opus and then with, the, with, the, with, the, with MBNF, he, he continued what he used to do with the, uh, with the Opus series and, and he's, he's doing a great success, mm -hmm. not in terms of only the brand MBNF, but for the watch industry. Mm -hmm. That's you a have cool. People are coming out, mm -hmm. and not only now in watches, but also in art. People who are sitting, hiding in, a, in an apartment somewhere in Europe or in Far East, he, he, he finds them, uh, commissions some art pieces, and he displays it to them, and he makes them famous. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great example of the, the collector you brought up a bit earlier that kind of, you know, he went in the opposite direction of what you would expect. And it's a, it's a, it's a strong counter example to, how, to illustrate how sometimes the success of a company and its message and its popularity can actually kind of work against it sometimes. And uh, you too, like, you know, as people who like, you know, are on the receiving end of this kind of messaging. Like, how do you feel about it? Do you, do you feel that you want to demonstrate your, your knowledge and understanding of the industry more by going more towards um, brands like, like the independent brands that have a less strong messaging in that way? Just, I, um, you know, I, as a... I do, um, uh, I do read a lot about the independent watchmaking. I do invest as well uh, mm -hmm. in the independent watchmaking. Uh, do you have a favorite? He's looking around. <laughs> Don't pretend. We see yes. you. <laughs> uh, there are a couple, to be honest. There are a couple of, of, of brands, not, not, not even in Europe. There is an, in, in Japan, we were discussing, there is a, 
Hamuji in Japan, he's as well an independent watchmaker with a mm -hmm. very, good, uh, uh, very good work. So um, I do this as an analyst as well and uh, study to deliver uh, the message I want to deliver mm -hmm. in, order, uh, in, in regards to the, to the watchmaking and the independent watchmaking as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, to deliver the message and deliver uh, what, how different watchmakers with different personalities can give. You know, you can, uh, can give out different pieces, uh, different uh, outcome. This is what I, uh, what I uh, deeply uh, read about and uh, what I understand. So given the example of maybe two watches which are equally good in terms of the mechanism, in terms of the design, in terms of, you know, the equal quality, basically, but one's from a more popular brand and one's from a more sort of independent niche brand, do you necessarily know which choice you'd make? Because you talk about, you know, expressing yes. the, the values that are important to you in terms of a certain yes. identity and all of that. Of course, like uh, b between an important brand and, and a normal brand, which mm -hmm. one would I choose? Or yeah. what, w what would I choose between, uh, like, in, in which? Because, I mean, you seem to suggest that, you know, it's your, uh, something that you want to do very yes. strongly is also to support independent brands yes, and sort of, of give them that sort of recognition that maybe a bigger brand wouldn't necessarily need. So, you know, given that choice of an equally good watch, you know, you have two, but one's by a big brand and one's by an independent brand. Am, am I correct to say that you would choose to support the... There is uh, Charles Fudgham. Mm -hmm. Charles Fudgham is... Uh, the, 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 they're starting their, their first wristwatch. Uh, uh, they already produced a couple of pieces in the market, a beautiful uh, time teller mm -hmm. only. Uh, I believe... Um, which I don't believe I've, I've seen any out, mm -hmm. out there, but this is one of the watches I would... Uh, mm -hmm. What about you? Independent yeah. side. Independent. Yeah. 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 So what about you, Aldous? What's your choice? You're in the hot seat. <laughs> oh, I'm independent all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm independent as it gets, you know, because the independent brands, the, I, the DNA represents mm -hmm. me as, as, as I feel I am, you know, I've had to be, uh, I've taken quite an avant-garde path in, in entertainment and, and the same thing with, with watchmaking. So, you know, give me a, a equivalent value, but you give me the choice between, you know, established name brand that's, you know, from a company two, 200 years old or something like that, or you give me you know, Kruger or Struthers, I'm going to go Kruger or Struthers mm -hmm. because not only does that represent innovation, but it also to me represents the future of where watchmaking is going to go. I want to invest in the future of watchmaking. Yes. Uh, not to say that investing in an established brand is the alternative, but for me personally, mm -hmm. you know, because purchases are so personal, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to invest in how I see the moves are made and who's making those moves in a way that's, you know, representative of me. And again, I'm a weird guy, <laughs> you know? I, I, I choose different things and I love the fact that there's a freedom of thought. It's, there seems to be more, more relevance to the, to the freedom of innovation when it comes to independent brands. Mm -hmm. Well, I like to think that all that's of us conformity. who appreciate and love mechanical watchmaking and we're a bit weird in a way aren't we i mean we're we're kind of stubborn about things because we're like kind of clinging on to stuff that well i mean it's obsolete but i think at the same time as we brought up earlier it's still relevant mohammed you kind of have like a dual perspective here as someone who who sells watches but also someone who who personally enjoys and is passionate about them so how do you kind of um sort of balance that when you look at the products that come your way it's difficult <laughs> Explain. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have, a, we have a system in the company that we have always to give priority to our consumers, mm -hmm. our collectors, our friends, and not to, not to entertain ourselves. So it's difficult, <laughs> uh, especially when it comes to pieces that are rare, limited, special. Mm -hmm. uh, we work closely with a lot of the brands that we represent to, to create 
Dubai editions or UAE editions, and we've been doing this since 2006. Mm -hmm. Some we of the most beautiful timepieces I've seen, by you. the way. We have created more than 40 watches so far. Uh, and all these watches were born after the passion me and my cousins have together. And it's something that we always want and we cannot have. So we create this so that we have more pieces coming and we can <laughs> purchase it. So. See, that's the personal side coming in, like the watches that you yeah. really like. It. But so. then, you know, we always have a twist. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we've done watches with, uh, with almost all the big brands, even, even with Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet. We created special editions for, for, for Dubai. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of new watches coming in this year as well as next year. Crazy things. Hamdan is always uh, one of our uh, first clients who's, uh, who's looking at the crazy things we are working on. And, and recently, we've been doing more and more with uh, the independent brands mm -hmm. because the personal touch we have with the brands because the flexibility that they're giving us in terms of creating something together that is not existing in the collection, but out of this world. So mm -hmm. 40, 40 limited editions? More than 40. And with how many different brands? Of maybe 12 or 13 <clears throat> brands. Okay. Guys, I'm going to open up the, the floor to Q&A in a bit, but you know, before we do that, maybe one final question for all our panelists. We can kind of uh, keep rolling on this because as technology, kind of bringing it back to the original sort of subject at hand, because technology will continue to evolve. There's, you, know, you can't really hold that back, but it will continue to endure. I mean, we're kind of all kind of invested in making this happen. So what aspects of it do you think that we should continue to emphasize to uh, sort of keep the relevance of watchmaking, mechanical watchmaking fresh, in the, even against evolving technology? What stays the same, even if everything else changes? Let the watchmakers come out and show what they can do. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, it is the passing of knowledge to the people about the people hidden behind the walls that are creating these timepieces is important. Openness, mm. transparency. Openness, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and show people. Where did Patek Philippe start from? Mm -hmm. 177 years ago. Mm -hmm. They started 178 years ago. Mm -hmm. They started with two guys producing watches. Mm -hmm. And today these two people who created the brand do not exist, but the brand exists. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows Patek and Philip because of their history and what they did. But today, we know <coughs> a lot of the watch brands because of the name or the marketing behind it. But who is behind it? Who is creating the product? Who is doing the product? Mm -hmm. They are unknown to people. So I think that if people know who is doing the products, they would appreciate the products even more. That's really interesting because I kind of see like a parallel with uh, something that we're seeing a lot of in technology, by the way. You talk about open source information, like really sort of breaking that down so that it becomes uh, something that everyone has access to, exactly. things that people should know and people should understand. Because the more you understand something, obviously the more you can appreciate it and love it. You guys, what's your take on this? What do you think is essential to keep our industry alive? From your point we, of view. We have a lot of strength in, uh, our, in our history and the foundation of how we started so I think that if we keep you know innovating with respect to the traditional foundation of, of watchmaking mm -hmm. um, how certain pieces are made you know how much time we give to polishing a bevel or so, you know all these things are interesting and I don't think we should ever discard those mm -hmm. uh, another strength that we have is in uh, our application of materials I mean there's a synergy uh, there's a synonymous aspect between a lot of things are, that are coming out in this digital age. You know, a lot of the things, they, they look, feel, seem, they feel the same. You know, they act the same. With mechanical watchmaking, we have the advantage of presenting materials in a new way. So as long as I think we continue to innovate and try to figure out how to present these very familiar items in very new ways, how can we come up with new finishes um, for, for 
certain things, I think we'll always be able to continue to evolve the idea of McKenna or present something new. But our strength is in our core history, and we've got to lean on that and, and, and figure out how to evolve that and keep it fresh in a way that honors tradition without, without losing you know, that fabric, without losing what it's, how it started. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Do you agree with that, Hamdan? Do you have a different yes. take? Even, 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 even though uh, there's uh, watchmakers or artists uh, going on the same direction, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what will keep it going are being different on the same direction. Even though they want to take the same direction, but they have to be slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we humans are emotional. This, is, this as well will keep it going. Today, we, 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 we're wearing our father's uh, watches, and uh, our sons will wear our watches, and it will keep on uh, going. Uh, today, you pass, you pass a painting or a, a Persian carpet or a, a, an amber stone to, to, your, to the next generation, mm -hmm. and it will be more useful and more valuable. But uh, will, will a smartwatch be as valuable or exactly. as, as useful. Yeah. As they say, you never really own a fine mechanical timepiece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like to paraphrase a good friend of ours. It's like yeah. an art piece. Exactly. Yeah. Something you can pass you on. Never own it. Now, at this point, I'm going to open up the floor to questions as well, if anyone has any. Is there someone standing by with microphones by any chance? So, like, yes. Hello, James. Good to see you. How are you doing? So far, so good. Um, yes. We all agree that art, that watches are that amazing combination of art and technology. But what we always discuss is the other role they play. Mm -hmm. That there are social desires. Mm -hmm. That you wear a watch because what it says about you. Mm -hmm. and, and the image you want to get to the people you meet. We've sort of touched on it slightly because a, wa a mechanical watch is an expression of self-identity, but that's kind of taking it a step further. Not just self-identity, but who you want to identify in the eyes of others. Who, is there someone in particular you want to address the question to? Or? I, think, I think they all have a view. Right, who wants to bite? Uh, I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, you have a valid point there, but uh, most of the watch buyers would go for something that would show what they have. Whereas a watch collector would not necessarily look at a product that is recognizable right away, but rather look at the content of the watch. Mm -hmm. if, if, if Hamdan, you can agree with me on yes, this. Exactly. So you, uh, can, you can have a watch that is not known as a collector, but it might be a tourbillon with a full face so that you wouldn't even know that it's an expensive watch. A person who doesn't understand watch would think it's a Daniel Wellington because it looks plain. God forbid. Yes. <laughs> uh, but then you have, on the other hand, the watch buyers would go for brands that are known. very known. Uh, you can know it from a mile away. Mm -hmm. And they would go for that watch because they want to be known that they got this watch or this watch was a difficult piece to get or they had to pay a high premium to get this watch and then people would recognize oh he's driving a rolls royce he's wearing the x watch that is very difficult to get with a mm -hmm. 25 years waiting list or whatever it is you know mm -hmm. so you have the two different types of people mm -hmm. i would say i agree there is the the, the discreet who, who uh, as a uh, who would wait for a watch uh, for a year and or six uh, years, or six years <laughs> and uh, uh, not caring about people knowing what this watch or what the content of the watch is uh, uh, or other people as you mentioned who, who would uh, rather uh, wear a, um, a Rolex with a full, full baguette diamond uh, mm -hmm. a presentable watch yeah, no, that's really cool, actually, because actually the three of you guys, which would you prefer? Like, you know, would you wear something that people come up to you and say, I know that guy, I love his work. Or would you want someone to come up to you and say, I've never seen that before, tell me more. I would wear something I like. Yeah. Good I answer. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, Good answer. wear something because 
Well, if in my situation, it will be difficult to wear something hot because then everyone will say, why the hell you're wearing it and we're not getting it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so better avoid that. Yeah. What about you guys, Aldous? Um, you know, my watch choices, uh, again, they, they represent me. I typically, so I began purchasing watches specific to the watchmaker. Uh, because of what that watchmaker taught me or how they influenced me. There are certain grail watches, you know, yeah. independent watches that I really can't wait to get my hands on. There are certain grail watches that are within bigger brands, you know. But for me, as long as it represents or says something about me, which is to go left when everybody else is going right, it becomes more personal to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a few collections that straddle the line. Uh, you know, I think like maybe for this generation, I think the the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak is sort of this generation's, you know, presidential, right? A lot of people know it, a lot of people want it for very reasons. You have people that want it because it's purely popular, commercialized in such a way where you can't help but know what it is. And then you have people that want the Royal Oak because Gerald Genta designed it and they understand the legacy and the history. So it's, it's kind of hard to compute uh, uh, what the real point is. It really comes down to the person. But for me, again, coming down to me personally, I buy things that I want to be able to tell you the story about. Mm -hmm. If you, Sometimes you know them, sometimes you don't. I'm impressed sometimes when people are like, hey, I know what that is because it's such and such. And I'm like, yeah. you did your research. Yeah. You did your homework. You know your stuff. Um, but I, I want to have a conversation, again, not about the monetary financial value of it, about the artistic value of it, mm -hmm. because I feel like it's a representation of myself. So, yeah. you know. I'm going to bring a little bit of audience participation into this, actually, because I'm actually interested in the outcome of this. Huh. Like, um, you know, a show of hands, like, obviously between, like, the watches that people recognize and the watches that you want to tell people about, which do you wear more often? Hands up, the people who wear more recognizable watches. Jesus, really? No, Don't be scared. On. I mean, I'm wearing a Daytona, so <laughs> my hands up. <laughs> no Seriously, wrong just three people? Okay, so, like, people, okay, I guess we've got, like, a sort of disproportionate amount of uh, independent watch brands in here, so I guess that's good. Kind of <laughs> so, okay, that was a bad question. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I admitted that was a, not a considered question. Right, any other questions from the audience, please? Gentlemen in the front, do you require a microphone? Yes, Dominic Scott. Hi, Susan. Um, so we talked today about uh, the smartwatch and the impact it may have on the industry. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, very yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So we spoke about the smartwatch and the impact it may have on the industry. Um, if I may, I'd like to also bring in the impact that we met, we're seeing from the grey market. Mm -hmm. and also from e-commerce today. Mm -hmm. In many respects, it seems easier com to communicate, mm -hmm. um, but also harder. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is it's easier to advertise, but it's more challenging to really communicate a story in detail. So, and if you look at e-commerce platforms now, they're buying watches, and quite sophisticated watches with algorithms. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question I have is, what does the brands and the retailers uh, and the independents need to do to mitigate these challenges? So e-commerce, grey market. Mm -hmm. That's a hot question. <laughs> and I would like to say that at this point in time, like, you know, I, I, you see a lot of brands taking control of their pre-owned market, actually, and that's, you know, you the could say thing. a response. Yes. Well, as, as, as a, a retailer, the grey market is always a threat. And, 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 uh, We've been seeing it growing heavily worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of gray market, I'm talking mm -hmm. about new pieces being sold at premiums, not vintage pieces or old pieces. Um, difficult to control, affects the retailers worldwide because what is not available with the retailer, it's always available in the gray market 
most probably and most of the time with a very high premium. Mm -hmm. uh, source of the watch, stolen, leaked from other agents, uh, does it have the papers, the, all of this is always under question and, and uh, not all consumers would go for that option. Mm -hmm. Uh, E-commerce, on the other hand, uh, is being supported heavily by a lot of the brands that are represented under groups, whereas uh, the independent brands and, uh, and my two friends here can, can support me. Would you buy a group at Forsey or a Richard Meal from online? Definitely not. <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I think people still want the personal touch when it comes to too expensive watches and they would like to have the experience of buying the watch, yeah. talking to an individual rather than talking to their computer. Well, see, yes and no, I don't think it's an either or situation, if you don't mind me saying, because it's possible to experience the watch in person but make the purchase online. Yeah. They're, they're not, you know. It could, it could happen as well, but mm -hmm. again, if you find something on the e uh, online mm -hmm. that is... They're complementary in a way. 60, 70 percent cheaper because it's discontinued, because people are not appreciating the brand, but you as a person, you like it, you know, mm -hmm. go for it. But no, it's, it's interesting because we're talking about the grey market here as a response to actual consumer wants. And as a collector, Hamdan, I mean, you don't have to name any names, but when you talk to your fellow collectors and all that, what are the kinds of conversations that you're having about, like, you know, pieces that you can't necessarily find, but you might be able to look in other channels and find them there. There, of course, the, the, the grey market is threat to retailers and mm -hmm. when they cannot find, there are uh, some people uh, who, would not, who wouldn't mind paying premium for a piece uh, and crazily premium, you know, and unfortunately, uh, which does not make sense. Sometimes they would, they would pay double the price. It does not make sense at all. Uh, but I believe eventually this, this this will stay, but and it, it's going to be wavy. It will go down. It will decrease, but it will go. It will go up again. Mm -hmm. It will decrease. It will have to decrease, and it will increase again. It will always stay there. But again, coming to the point uh, with the with the gray market, it's always targeting the watch buyers, not collectors, mm. because which is why the environments aren't super qualitative. If you look online, yes. And it's always for the hot pieces that are in demand and... Exactly. A collector, and a collector would want to, meet, to, 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 to interact with the, with, the, with the watchmaker. He would want to be there, uh, ask questions, know more about what he's buying. Mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as, exactly, yes, exactly, go to the factory. So I guess the question we need to be focusing on is how do you transition these people who are from one side looking purely for a product into people who can actually appreciate the finer points of it. I think that's something that we all need to think about. Any other questions from the floor, please? Stefano, please. If you can wait two seconds for Dominic to bring you the microphone, it will be clearer. Pass it down. So talking about design, mm -hmm. um, my question here, but today we are very lucky because we have some very creative people like uh, Alice like I never met before, uh, but he's very brilliant. We have Aurelie, we have Steven, we have Edouard uh, from, with very different profiles. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, we, we come with, from, from, from a past, so we still talk about Gerard Genta, uh, who was a genius. Mm -hmm. Um, but my question is, uh, with uh, such brilliant new designers, uh, what will be uh, the next step in uh, maybe a field where we we'll are still keep going, talking about most of the <coughs> best sellers in the market uh, have been designed by people 50 years ago or 60 years ago, mm -hmm. and what is your perspective in terms of innovation, in terms of uh, new designs coming in the future? Uh, Aldous, I think this is you. right up your alley. You want to <laughs> take it? Really? <clears throat> yeah. Here's the ball. <laughs> Catch. Uh, so my philosophy for myself as a designer, innovator in any sense is how can I be the answer to the unasked question? A lot of times things are given to us and we find dependence on them not realizing two, three years ago 
well, I didn't, you know, I didn't know I wanted this so bad. I didn't know I needed this so bad, right? Um, so how can I find ways to give something, give people a different experience, visceral experience with the product that they aren't getting yet? And then also, how can I contribute something to my field in terms of watchmaking that becomes innovation of materials, innovation of uh, how to apply indications, mechanical advancements, all this wrapped up into the experience I want to give the consumer because you are selling an experience. I want you to buy me my DNA. The whole process of buying the watch has to be something you remember for the rest of your life. Hence why we would like to go into the store and talk to the watchmakers and you know. Um, so in terms of the future, it's hard to say because like art, it's, the success is, uh, I don't want to say it's unquantifiable, but you know, some things take off that you just don't realize. And it could be something as simple as adding a new angle to a, a, a case. And people are like, oh my God, it's the hottest thing ever. You know, and then you kind of hedge your bets and see what people like. So you got two options. Either you continue that trend and try to repeat that in different ways, or you say, okay, this is what it is. That's great. It's been done. Why was it so successful? You study that history of that success in, uh, to you know, a further extent, and then you say, that did well because of this. What's missing? Mm -hmm. OK, this is missing. I haven't seen this. This is how I design. I literally design <clears throat> things that manufacturers tell me, brother, this is not possible. Stop it. And I'm like, not possible yet. You know, We might have to defy the laws of physics, but hey. That's our challenge. Um, but I think it all comes down to what new experiences, how, how can we help people experience time telling differently? Mm -hmm. What is it about that where you say, I got this because of boom, 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 boom. You know, this is different. I've never seen this before. I've never been exposed to this. And it's a compilation of, of elements. Mm -hmm. um, definitely material choice, definitely mechanical composition, said application as well. Um, but it is really hard to pinpoint that next thing that's just going to strike lightning. We just got to keep trying. Yeah. But it, it all comes down to information at the end of the day. And almost understanding that means studying behavioral patterns in people more than studying the actual watch. I can do anything with the watch. I can always project what the watch is going to do or what I want it to do. I, I, I can't predict people that way. Mm -hmm. So when I study the familial patterns and understand what engages them, it helps inform how I'm going to present myself to them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important take on design as a, as a concept because what you said that design is the answer to an unasked question, I think that's something that we need to kind of get our minds around because design is not just an aesthetic thing. Right. It's when you look at the word design, it, it speaks about purpose and intention. If you say something was done by design, it's very purposeful, it's deliberate. And now, I kind of want to ask the two of you guys, Hamdan and Muhammad, when's the last time you actually saw a design that made you think, this is new, this is fresh, that really excited you in that way, and what mm. was it? I think uh, Muhammad would agree. I'm the end of an Orwick. Mm -hmm. I'm the end of an Orwick. And they did not only uh, uh, made good designs, but good work, good mechanisms, beautiful watches that uh, they, they did. Uh, I believe it was very brave to, to, to do such designs. Mm -hmm. And uh, now recently people started um, interacting properly with those des designs in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, and Nef and Uruk, I believe they did uh, good work. Sure. Yeah. Anything to add, Mohamed? Uh, I, I think also Richard, I would add Richard Meal mm -hmm. to, 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 to make the modern tonneau shape, uh, the nice. comeback of mm -hmm. a modern tonneau shape in the early 2000s was also a breakthrough in the, in the design. A lot of brands tried to, to recreate the tonneau shape again mm -hmm. after Richard Meal, but with no success. And I think it was just the way he designed it, mm -hmm. how it fits on the wrist, it just worked. Yeah, just a particular combination yes, of factors. Yes. I think we have time for a couple more questions. We've got like a, a ton of journalists in the room. Like, let's have some questions. Paul, 
Uh, Mike, let's pass it down, if we can. Take it away. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, you, you raised a number of very pertinent questions and um, a lot of relevant points in, in, in your moderation, particularly about targeting a younger audience, a new demographic, how do we anticipate customers' needs? And maybe if I could take a next step, it seems to me that one of the questions we're answering, as, asking is how can we make watchmaking cool for a younger generation or for the next generation? It strikes me that we have really the person to do that sitting on the stage in front of us, having heard what he says and having seen his background, Aldis, and also the other members of the panel. A, a simple question, does the watch industry need more people like Aldis? Wow. <laughs> Well, I'm going to just go ahead and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like that question. <laughs> Favorite question at night. All right. Yeah. Um, Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, so I, I, I have a passion for education because I believe education is the, the open door to opportunity. Regardless of your situation, I, I speak to kids all the time and I tell them that you are not uh, a product of your environment. Your environment is a product of you. And, you know, my mom gave me this um, because of where we were, where she pulled us out of. And for me, the idea is to figure out how to give that back. So I, one, I, I, a couple of reasons why I started a company and a couple of real goals. Um, you know, the, the first major reason was legacy. I want to create sustainable legacy for my family. It's not about money. It's about giving opportunity, continuous opportunity down the line and something to hold, take care of, be proud of, you know. Uh, but beyond that, I want uh, to also sort of have a, a, a conduit for charitable contribution because I would love to be able to establish at some point, uh, uh, you know, scholarships in, in our name, but beyond that, uh, I wanted summer programs where I bring inner city kids at, you know, five, six, seven, all the way up to, you know, 16, 17, give them a summer where they're sitting there engineering, working on the CNC tools, working with their hands, because a lot of these kids have the interest, they just don't have the outlet and they don't have the, uh, uh, they don't have a conducive environment to their success that's going to support that, right? Now, regardless, of whether they become watchmakers or not, it's not the point. The point is to acknowledge and inspire the potential of their future. They're always going to have some sort of tie <laughs> to, to, to watchmaking because, you know, we, we're, we sought to support that, but it's about education. And they can go do whatever they want with that engineering knowledge because there's so many different avenues. But I feel like if you know, we, and, and I say we collectively as the watch industry or, or you know, even, even with the bigger conglomerates, the, the groups, um, invest in the idea of educating and, better, you know, furthering the future potential of these kids. You know, I, there's so many different places. I, you know, I live in California, so many different places there, so many different places in New York, Chicago, all over the U.S., all over the world, really, where these kids could benefit greatly enriching our future secures our foundation. That is not the point. It's not about securing us, but I mean it secures the thinker in terms of their relationship with the idea of innovation. And when it comes down to it, we represent our innovation at its core. And that's what we want to do is continue that, that sort of, I don't want to say it's a trend. We, we want to continue that habit. We want people to habitually be innovative. But it does come down to what are you contributing to said society. And if we start with the kids and give them something, acknowledge them and show them that we understand you have this potential for education, let's put you there. Mm -hmm. They'll understand how to take us from where we are to the whole next generation of design that we can't even fathom at this point. Okay. Guys, it's almost 12.30, so one last question, because it's nearly lunchtime. I don't know about you guys, I'm Asian, I want my food. Uh, sir, sorry if you want to, Barbara. Very noble urge. Maybe, it, well. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. 
Go on, Barbara. Hi. I'm going to I'm going to piggyback a little bit on on Paul's and maybe just add this uh, a little. Muhammad, uh, I was honored enough to attend Dubai Watch Week last year, and one of the things that I found so amazing and intriguing, and John and I spoke about this today, was your children's program that you did. It inspired me. I, I've actually written a, a watch-related children's book, yes. which was released at Basel this, this year. Mm -hmm. And that is an initiative of mine, is as a parent of two young children, teaching them more about the ins and outs. Um, and I think, uh, Alice and I, we even kind of talked about this a little yeah. bit today. What, what, kind of what Paul said, what, you know, here you have a show, like I'll, I'll use Basel World as an example, where people are actually allowed to bring their children in, mm -hmm. you know, even where is the idea of set up a, a, a camp, a class, something like you guys did? I mean, do you think that there are opportunities for places, you know, like, like Christie's to do a little kids department? I don't mean little kids even necessarily, but seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, where you can get them before we lose them to this, mm -hmm. so to speak, well, if we haven't really lost them already. This already. So but, it's a, it's well, I mean, because here's the thing, we've lost millennials. We can't, mm -hmm. there's no, you know, they're, they're gone, but we have Gen Z and they are the influenced generation. They're influenced, they're, they're, they can, if you get them young, we're living, we're watching them grow up, I'm, I'm raising them right now. You know, do you think whether it's brands or trade shows or, or retailers, could be doing more to reach them so that 20 years from now they become Aldous. Mm -hmm. well, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that's not depending on us as retailers or Christie's. It's, it's really the parents. If, if, mm -hmm. if the parents want to, to, to take their kids to that direction, obviously us as retailers, we should support that. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's the initiative. Uh, uh, Christie's and uh, the team from Dubai Watch Week. Uh, and I, I would give a special thanks to my cousin Hind to initiate this. And, and uh, it wasn't targeting the kids of the family of Siddiqui only. It was all the kids in Dubai that family wanted to come and enjoy the Watch Week. They would come and sit there and, and, and get a little bit of background about watches, about auctions, how to auction and all of this. It opens a new gateway to them, mm -hmm. but again, if, 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 if a family member is coming to attend the watch week and would say, listen, kids, stay home, this is your iPad, that's the mistake of the parent. But, mm -hmm. but if they say, listen, we're going to somewhere where you would see something new and some watches, why don't you come? And they end up coming there and seeing a ch children's section, that's an added point. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, something that goes both ways. And congratulations on the book. We have to get them. Yes. <laughs> Guys, it is to my eternal regret that I have to wrap this up because I feel like this could go on for some time. But, you know, stick around. There's still more discussions happening later in the day. And uh, it's lunchtime. Thank you so much to my panel, Thank Mohammed, you. Hamdan and Aldis. And see you all, audience, and watching online as well.